Okay, Julie, the floor is yours. All right. Uh, let me make sure I can advance there. So I have no financial interests or relationships that can, can be considered a conflict of interest. Just a, a little bit of background of who I am and what I do, which is actually going to be relevant for this presentation. So besides um, assuming uh, the dean role of the College of Graduate Studies, where we have a growing number of programs, uh, I'm also directing the Medical Ethics and Humanities program and have been um, since uh, 2005. And as a clinical ethicist, I serve four clinical sites, including Direction Home, where um, Direction Home is a four county area agency on aging. And this uh, Direction Home actually meets the needs of both rural and urban uh, family. So I'll, I'll be mentioning them later in this presentation. I'm also a medical and graduate educator for pre-professional and professional learners, um, namely physicians, pharmacists, uh, nurse, nurse practitioners, and uh, public health officials. And so learning from them, as well as being able to have the, the uh, fortunate opportunity to engage in educational uh, classroom, as well as community education uh, opportunities, I've gained uh, in, a, a different perspective, I think, on some of our both rural and urban communities. I was inspired by some of the work I did with Asia Inc. Um, in Akron area, and I know there's a, a Cleveland um, site as well. And over the past decade, I've been working with refugee populations and those seeking asylum, um, even going to the US-Mexico border. And so I am gonna be talking about refugee populations as well as those uh, individuals that Direction Home uh, fulfills in terms of our aging population and our population with disabilities. And I'm also gonna be talking a little bit about human trafficking. So I will give an overview of Portage and Lucas counties, uh, just for those of you who may not be familiar with these particular counties. I am from Portage County. I live in Kent, Ohio. I work at Rootstown, um, which is still within the, the county. And as a educator, but also researcher of marginalized and vulnerable populations, um, these particular three populations, resettled refugees, victims of human trafficking and our aging and disabled populations. I know they, they hit home wherever we live, whether you are in Cleveland, whether you're in Akron Canton um, or in Portage and Lucas counties. And so uh, I'm pointing out some of the, the things that we all share, but also why pockets of rural health also have a, a drastic impact on these populations. My area is actually psychiatric ethics and mental health. Um, as a cognitive science, I've uh, been working with mental health uh, populations, particularly uh, of recent refugee populations. And so I will bring everything back to a focal point on mental health. Um, these topics are huge and I, I accept that. Um, but I think we can start making a collective headway in improving the mental health of our communities, first by awareness and second by recognizing the vulnerabilities of these populations in particular. And then I'll open up for Q&A, open discussion. I'm interested to hear your perspectives, your experiences, and um, we will go from there. All right, so what's interesting, um, when I was asked to do this presentation, I've been, you know, I'm familiar with some of the, how our, our counties are divided, what constitutes as rural counties, partially rural and urban counties. And actually Lucas and Portage County are considered urban counties, uh, believe it or not. Um, however, there's, there are many pockets of rural communities within these counties. And oftentimes I found that the pockets of rural um, communities within these counties um, are often overlooked. And yes, access to care is an issue and it remains an issue. Even though Portage County has a number of hospitals, for example, and I could speak um, directly from Portage County experiences, 
oftentimes we do find that even patients that are 10 miles away, 15 miles away, may not have transportation. We have part of bus systems, we have Uber, just like you know, most cities, um, but transportation is an, and continues to be an ongoing issue, um, especially if somebody's all outside of those bus routes. And I found the same with my um, clinical partners and colleagues that live outside of the Toledo area in Lucas County. So I just want to point out that Ohio recognizes, the state of Ohio recognizes these counties as urban. But I also caution when we do have these, I uh, would say designations of, of how we identify what is rural, what is urban and, and so forth, that we have to recognize those pockets of, of rural communities. So a little bit about Lucas County. It is a Northwest urban county. It was established in 1835 and it was named after the 12th governor of Ohio. It is approximately 100 miles west of Cleveland. Um, actually, my uncle lives, <laughs> lives there. And um, I will tell you that there has been some significant access of care. He's been wanting to go to the Cleveland Clinic for a number of um, heart heart issues, cardiac issues, and that 100 miles um, to get to some of the, the major hospital systems outside of the Toledo or Maumee area um, has been a challenge. It is the fourth smallest county by land area. Um, the population, as you can see from the 2020 census, is about 431,000. And what I want to call attention to are the unemployment rate and the poverty rates. Uh, because these poverty rates and unemployment rates are uh, on par with many of our communities. Um, the poverty rate in particular, as I took a deeper dive into these rates, um, it is really affecting our sp special populations, including our refugees and immigrants. Um, the, Lucas County is actually designated as a certified welcoming community. And um, this certification has been really valuable in getting resources for refugees and immigrants to lower that poverty rate. I'll also be talking about some of the human trafficking initiatives and survivors, as well as our general underrepresented and underserved minorities. Some of the health factors that are intrinsic to this county include racial and ethnic disparities. Um, the poverty rate of Black and Latinx is double. 37% compared to our white populations, and 39% of the population has high blood pressure, cardiac issues, um, mental health and coping behaviors, and um, significant percentage of depression. And actually the smoking rate is about a quarter of that population. Um, cardiac issues, high blood pressure um, have been identified even in the hospital systems um, throughout Toledo as being the number one um, issue. For Portage County, um, this was established in 1808. It's about 30 miles south of Cleveland. It takes me about 40, 45 minutes um, when I'm not in traffic. Uh, and, it, and the county is about 504 square miles. It is the 15th most populated of the 88 counties with 162,000. And the unemployment rate's a little bit lower, but as you can see, the poverty rate is almost comparable to Lucas County. Our special populations include refugees and undocumented persons. We have several migrant workers um, within our community. We have portions and pockets of the Amish and Mennonite, um, and particularly Amish and Mennonite um, children that often um, I work at Akron Children's as an ethicist and um, on their IRB. And we often have these populations that go from Portage County into Summit County so that they can get the necessary health care. Um, again, transportation becomes an issue. We have a growing elderly population, as we see with most of our counties in Ohio, um, but also a significant portion of the elderly uh, population have additional physical and um, psychological disabilities. Again, I'll be talking about human trafficking survivors. While it's not as prominent as Lucas County, um, it is uh, our county is a gateway um, for many of the human trafficking behaviors. Our health factors are primarily focusing on mental health and coping behaviors. 
with again, high smoking rates and um, an increase of depression. And I would also add anxiety. Suicide rates, particularly among our special populations are on the rise. And these are some of the things that we are concerned about. Here at Neomed, we've done some initiatives to combat um, mental health as well as addiction issues, which is part of mental health. Um, and so we're really actively working together among multiple departments uh, and hospitals to address these issues. And I could speak more of that in the Q&A. So because we're basically considered urban, um, I do want to mention the importance of the rural reach and how even urban communities, whether you're living in Stark County or Cuyahoga County, there's this notion of this rural reach that um, regardless of how we're defined, what borders that um, are, are given to us, uh, this is uh, our our work has a great impact on, on rural communities and how we work with rural communities, whether it's telehealth, whether it's providing better access via transportation or simply recognizing the variability of populations. So the University of Toledo, Neomed, Kent State, among several public and private institutions do train, we recruit and train students um, from rural communities. It's part of our mission, in fact. And we wanna continue to increase rural workforces to go back into the rural populations, but also to have uh, individuals from rural communities to be engaged in urban communities to better educate and uh, improve awareness about the social needs, about the health disparities that are intrinsic to rural populations. Several hospital systems within these counties, um, including satellite clinics, uh, for example, University of Hosp Hospitals, Cleveland, we have University Hospitals of Portage County. And so um, the satellite clinics and the, the additional hospitals as part of a system is a, a really great way to make these particular connections, increase awareness and improve education. The urban, suburban, and rural communities within these counties, um, I want to address um, throughout this presentation some of the misconceptions about the issues and needs of special populations. Um, for example, and I'll mention this again, um, that uh, those that are victims of human trafficking, there's this general assumption that human trafficking takes place strictly in urban communities, and that's not the case at all. So I'm first going to focus on our refugee, immigrant, and migrant populations, and then I will segue into our human trafficking, and then finally our elderly and disabled populations. For those of you who might not be um, engaged in, in refugee health or um, any type of the resettlement processes, I want to let uh, you guys into the, the world of some of the ethical dilemmas uh, regarding just the, the basis of how a refugee is, is defined. Um, a refugee is defined by the UN as someone owing to a well-founded fear of being persecuted for reasons of race, religion, nationality, membership of a particular social group or political opinion, is outside of the country of his or her nationality, and is unable to or owing to such fear is unwilling to avail himself of the protection of that country. And so this is oftentimes the definition that is used in, in many times strictly for the resettlement process. And when an individual who is seeking asylum is able to go through the process to become an identifiable refugee. And so if somebody is seeking asylum, they are not guaranteed refugee status, even though they may fit some version of this definition, how this definition is interpreted um, based on the community, based on who is doing the processing of refugee um, health and the resettlement process, it, the variability is vast. And oftentimes individuals who um, would otherwise be identified as a refugee, be able to resettle 
um, start regaining some identity and and uh, perseverance in their own livelihood, um, many are just um, turned away from being able to have access to even the the definition and the process for refugee care. And so um, this is one of the challenges that I see globally, but also even in our community. And when refugees are resettled, it depends on which community it has the necessary resources to offer housing, employment, health care, translators and interpreters. And so I'm seeing that in some communities, for example, Summit County may have a ample translation service and, and interpretation services, but Portage County does not. And so when you have a refugee from say Guatemala that is, doesn't speak the language and there's various languages within Guatemala, not just Spanish speaking, um, we do not necessarily have the resources to accommodate their needs, even in the screening process. Some of the resettled populations within the outreach of Lucas and Portage counties, um, it's vast. Uh, I don't think enough people realize uh, the magnitude uh, and number of refugees we have within these counties, but also where they're from. I primarily worked with um, refugees with the northern from the Northern Triangle, as well as Bhutan and Nepal. Um, we have a very large population in Summit County um, Nepalese speaking Bhutanese refugees, um, but they're also coming into uh, Portage County um, for security and for housing. So just a little background on that. Healthcare barriers are significant and we are seeing this in both Lucas and uh, Portage counties as well as other counties throughout Ohio. Um, the number of uh, cases of discrimination where we see uh, refugees, and I will give a couple examples where I had consults of um, individuals of Asian descent during COVID. Um, I had a Nepali speaking Bhutanese refugee right here in Portage County that was um, physically abused, had to go to the emergency room um, due to discrimination. Um, he was uh, basically attacked for being Asian. And so when you have healthcare professionals not quite understand or recognize some of the uh, outcomes of discrimination and physical violence, uh, getting to the root cause of why this person is here and what do they need, it's not just the physical uh, support and the bandaging of, of open wounds, it's also the mental health and, and social support as well. And so lack of understanding, stigma, um, the integration of, for example, Eastern healthcare with Western healthcare and recognizing, for example, some populations don't believe in things like mental health. And so when you are trying to uh, provide those supportive services and reduce suicidality, uh, oftentimes many of these populations don't have a concept of mental health. And those are the things that we need to be aware of, as well as the more apparent issues of language barriers, affordability of health care. I will, I will say that working with our Northern Triangle refugees and our uh, Nepali speaking Bhutanese refugees, nutrition has been significant or the lack thereof rather has been significant. Um, and interesting to note that when you have refugee resettled populations, they might have had relatively decent nutrition um, in their refugee camps or even in their home, home country. But when they acculturate to American culture, their nutritional needs can actually disintegrate. I've had families that found the love of Coca-Cola and um, they had issues with uh, diabetes, they had issues with their teeth, uh, dental issues, because they would be consuming mass quantities of Coca-Cola because it was something new, it was something sweet that they loved, uh, but this was an issue of nutrition. So, and again, the, the transportation issues. 
When we look at human trafficking um, as a population, just some basic facts, um, and, and many of you might work with this population of um, human trafficking victims, but every year one to two million men and women uh, and children become victims of human trafficking. Traffickers can make anywhere between five to 50,000. I've heard even some on the black, the dark net, the black internet, um, that it's even higher depending on age. And again, the misconceptions that this only exists in big cities. Yes, this occurs quite often when there are uh, major NFL football games or um, major events in cities. Uh, in fact, uh, more and more law enforcement are on the lookout because these things tend to happen during major events. Um, but in Ohio, we're seeing this in our own backyards. And so Ohio is actually ranked 14 out of 50 states for active criminal human trafficking cases, and 86% of those victims being minors. And the reason, one of the reasons, and I think one of the main reasons, the more that I, I connect with folks, are as the, the major highways. And a lot of the traffic occurs where you have full uh, rigs, big rigs, um, trucks that are bringing mass amounts of women and children across state lines and into Canada. And at least 1,800 people at any point that we know of um, at a point in time in Ohio are held in bondage. And so the governor started a task force back in 2019 and has accelerated funding um, since then to address these issues. And just to give a, a picture of, I mean, when you start looking, oh yeah, we have a, a lot of interstates and high, interstate highways. So 21 with seven major connecting um, trafficking routes. And they're going through the Toledo, Youngstown, Canton, um, Akron, and they're hitting Portage County and Lucas County along the way. So, so Toledo is known as a global gateway city and known victims of trafficking. Again, there's a, probably a whole population of unknown are found in Toledo each year. Um, and this is 2023 data as a port city, as an international border city. It's not too too far to get up to Detroit and then over to Canada. Young people are delivered to each other against their will. It was the third largest global gateway city for sex um, child sex tourism in 2010. And we uh, dropped down to fourth place. This is still not good, but efforts have been made, um, significant efforts have been made in Lucas County to address these issues. Um, it's interesting, Toledo, along with Miami, Portland, Oregon, Las Vegas, um, Toledo is named um, along with those major cities. And so I want to shout out to our folks at University of Toledo in addressing uh, human trafficking. And they have a human trafficking and social justice institute that was started in 2015. And the university hosts the oldest and largest annual trafficking conference in the US, uh, attracting folks from 42 states, 30 countries, and their aim to educate, increase awareness, identify ways to prevent and intervene. And so um, kudos to University of Toledo for taking lead. And I, I hope we can learn more from some of their initiatives. For Portage County, um, yes, we are uh, a, a gateway, not as significant as Lucas County, but we have I-76 and I-80, and our law enforcement has been um, increasing awareness and being alert, uh, particularly of uh, semi-trucks and, and so forth that may be um, bringing individuals, but they're also looking at on an individual basis. We have um, actually in Ravenna, um, and Ravenna is uh, about 10 minutes away from me right now, we have identified individuals that have been held captive, forced into sex and domestic labor, and there was a significant ring 
um, that included Stark, Summit, and Portage County. And so law enforcement stopped that ring um, about four or five years ago. What came out of um, some of the building of awareness was this project known as Project Promise. And it was an effort to collect narratives from victims, um, from healthcare professionals, from others that were taking um, initiative and care of that community. And so um, they launched a project um, just last year called Silhouette Voices Heard. And it's an effort to dispel the myths, such as it doesn't always happen in the cities and to be on a lookout for some of the nuances in both the pockets of, of rural communities as well as um, those communities that are off of major highways. The last population um, that I uh, would like to uh, talk about and open for discussion is our Medicare population. As we all know, um, we are an aging population and with age comes additional health factors and uh, a growing number of disabilities that unfortunately are not always addressed. And so I pulled this off of our area Office of Aging in the Northwestern sector, and this is uh, Lucas County um, as one example. So the pop percent of population of age 75 and older um, we are seeing a, an increase um, by 20, 2040. Um, it seems to be at the, the pinnacle top and then declines from there. Um, so that means that we have a good 15, 17 years where we're gonna see a, a significant increase of our um, growing elderly population. And the percent of population uh, of, of aging groups living with functional difficulties uh, it, include self-care, cognitive, ambulatory. You can see ambulatory here on the chart is growing. Um, the independent living situation, and I'm seeing working at Direction Home and sitting on their board, I'm seeing a, a greater number of um, individuals that do not have support systems, do not have family members that are willing to um, be there um, or simply do not have the means financial social or ability because of living with their own disabilities to take care of their aging parents or um, other family members. And then vision and hearing is on the rise. So mental health factors with, and kind of the overarching theme of all these three populations, I, I've been doing a lot of work on issues on forced displacement. And the forced displacement of refugee populations is quite apparent, right? I mean, individuals that have had to flee their countries because of persecution, as well as victims of trafficking that have been forced out of their, their homes, have been forced out of um, what they knew to be um, their, their lives and manipulated and forced out of state and even out of country. Our elderly and disabled um, some would say this is a reach about forced displacement, but we are seeing a growing number of elderly and those individuals with disabilities or a combination of both um, being forced out of their homes without options, without the opportunity to bring in more home health care. So Direction Home, um, for example, has a, a bevy of social work, of nursing, of supportive services where the effort is to have individuals stay in their homes, get receive health care um, to the best of, of one's ability without having to be automatically transferred into assisted living or nursing homes. And so that is just one, one organization, one effort, um, but we're I'm seeing in Portage County in particularly, uh, my folks in Lucas County uh, might echo the very same, that elderly are often not given the choice. And so if they have injury, such as a, a broken hip, falling down, um, either their family or even healthcare providers would recommend automatic transfer into um, other facilities without considering um, the, the opportunity, um, when that opportunity is available and can meet their, their medical needs to live at home. 
And so the issue of forced displacement, even when it's justified among our elderly population, addressing the mental health issues when one has to leave their home is quite significant. Uh, I did some work in, in South America and the number one rate of suicidality is actually their elderly population um, being either not taken care of properly by family or friends um, or having to be displaced in this particular way. And I, I don't wanna see that happening as we see our growing elderly population um, because the mental health issues of being forcefully displaced um, is quite significant. and we need to do a better job in, in delivering those mental health resources. So the other mental health disorders and illnesses that often go undetected of all three of these populations, sexual violence and rape. And yes, I've um, unfortunately been uh, privy to some uncomfortable discussions in nursing homes where um, individuals have been uh, violently attacked um, by other, other patients, even by other um, healthcare professionals. Um, the issue of witnessing or experiencing violence like we have in our refugee populations where they are re-traumatized um, and they have not had an opportunity to have the, the PTSD and so forth addressed um, from their previous experiences. Torture, imprisonment, um, the feelings of imprisonment even um, need to be addressed as well as uh, general neglect and abuse. So PTSD, depression, suicide, anxiety, drug and alcohol abuse, and then the feelings of shame and guilt alienation and isolation um, are intrinsic in all three of these populations and is on the rise. For our refugee mental health, um, PTSD is a major mental disorder that has been uh, studied, has been uh, widely recognized globally. And as you can imagine, whether it's trauma, war, neglect, starvation, all of this, all of these factors contribute to PTSD. And yes, they do have a very high rate of suicide and untreated depression, anxiety. And in part, like I mentioned before, um, if there's no concept of mental health, if they don't understand what mental health and mental health resources are available, um, then they're, they're not reaching out, nor are we asking the appropriate questions at times. Ooh, skipped a song, sorry about that. Um, the human trafficking effects, um, they're likely to experience many of the same things. And here is a laundry list, it's not an exhaustive laundry list of those additional things that they experience that may help you in recognizing or at least asking the questions and exploring whether or not this individual has been human trafficked. Um, they have come into our hospitals, our clinics um, with what we believe to be a family member or a friend and when in fact the individual is the, the trafficker. And so um, some of these uh, behaviors, some of these experiences might help you at least ask the questions about you know, who this individual is with, how are, do they feel safe, um, and so forth. And then in our um, mental health community among older adults, uh, I pulled this from Lucas County. Uh, Lucas County has done an amazing job of at least uh, recognizing and collecting a significant amount of data. And so we can see the um, features that are really contributing to mental health. Abuse, as you can see, self-neglect, neglect and exploitation. And then um, we can't uh, forget our LGBTQIA plus community, um, which uh, talk about intersectionality. When you have elderly disabled members of the LGBTQIA community, um, underrepresented minorities, all the layers and the, and the intersectionality that contribute, you can imagine um, the abuse, stigma, and discrimination that may be present. And teasing out um, the root causes and um, issues may be challenging. Um, and so we need to recognize th those layers and the intersectionality that is presented. 
various organizations that do and have been making an impact. I'm going to shout out to our universities and colleges. Um, we have amazing students that are innovative, that are compassionate, that do want to change the world for the better. And so capturing those students um, it has been first and foremost my mission as an educator. Um, I appreciate their ingenuity, their curiosity. And so um, I, that's always at the top of my list and it's my bias, um, but also the wonderful hospital systems we have. We are fortunate in Northeast Ohio and beyond um, within the state of Ohio, some really incredible hospital systems that are making incredible impact and a difference. And they're aligning with universities, they're aligning with uh, law enforcement and county courts. And so we need to continue on um, those initiatives. I also want to shout out for some of the nonprofit resettled refugee programs, such as the social services for the Arab community in the Toledo area, um, Asia Inc. in Akron and um, Cleveland area, which we in Portage County, um, we rely on. We ask the questions. We're educated by these wonderful agencies that are trying to make a difference. Uh, our community centers and our Catholic charities and other non-secular organizations and places of worship. And then um, I wanna shout out again to our area agencies on aging. Um, you know, if, if we're all working together, I think we, in increasing awareness and, and improving access, the delineation of rural and urban and suburban and, and all of that, um, is not as, as significant as how do we work together to improve healthcare and access to healthcare as a, a larger community. So important take home points, create safe living arrangements for displaced persons, uh, provide healthcare services and basic needs, um, identify those victims and, and prosecute the per perpetrators, um, hold people accountable for these. Um, develop mental health prevention programming through education and advocacy and deliver better communication strategies to combat a lot of the miscommunication that we see and misconceptions along with stigma and discrimination. So those are my take home points. I'm sure there's there's several more that you guys can imagine and, and have been working with. And so I look forward to um, answering questions, but also opening a dialogue of, of what you're doing and um, you know, how, how we can make our communities better regardless where we live. So thank you. That was excellent. Thank you so much. Um, a lot of kind of later stage translational science benefits opportunities with public policy, public health, any thoughts, is anyone working with rural communities or doing work around any of the kind of priority items that Dr. Altman has shared with us? And Dr. Glavin, if you wanna share about your report that was just launched, that might be helpful. Okay, um, I'm Ivan Glavin. I'm part of the faculty at Case, and uh, we just conducted the first uh, Cuyahoga County City of Cleveland the AAPI community profiling, and so we have uh, two two hundred uh, vaccination hesitancy and social determinant health and uh, factors, and we also conduct uh, a ethnic group and uh, with a focus group we try to understand the issues. And uh, so Dr. Altman, you mentioned about a couple populations are very um, kind of consistent with what we have found. One is the refugees populations. And I think there's a lot of issues we um, will assume they have uh, uh, 90 days or 60 days uh, uh, waiver period that they're able to settle, but they can't. Um, it takes us many years to settle for the first immigrant uh, generation immigrants, and they have 90 days. Right, that's a so, challenge. <laughs> yeah, so I don't know, you know, how, what is your way in looking at the issues and how to address that issues? Uh, seems like you, you you did a lot of study on this side. 
So I, I think this is an opportunity for this group and CVCT and, and others to uh, do some do some research on this and to show the data and to show the government the data uh, that, you know, 90 days is not a lot and to explain the processes and procedures. And I, I see uh, Richard's question about legal help with asylum status. So yes, so legal aid is is offered. Um, in fact, one of my former law students is um, has been working in the Akron area on legal aid and has been focusing on um, refugee populations. A lot of our agencies um, have have legal aid, legal assistance, such as Asia Inc. But it's not vast, and it takes time. And to Yi Han's um, description of the 90 days, we don't have that time to not only deliver vaccines and appropriate health screenings, but also, as you guys know, <laughs> legal support and legal advice takes a significant amount of time um, to make sure that individuals have access to the things they need, but also a fair and due process. Um, We've had a couple of incidents while individuals were in the resettlement process that they committed petty theft. And so the question is, do they get deported? What happens? Should their, their refugee status be revoked? And without recognizing this individual or these individuals have, had, have not had access to healthy food or even food at all for some time. And so getting the legal support, getting the healthcare support can be quite time consuming. And we need to do a better job of collecting that data. And as researchers, um, we have the skill set to, to help, help agencies and help our legal aid folks and friends um, collect that data. So great questions. Appreciate that. Yeah, just uh, for your information, uh, Dr. Abner, you may like to be kind of part of the discussions. Um, there's a group of uh, 18 refugees service organization and try to pull themselves together and to deal with the issues as a group rather than individually, because each of them serve only certain amount of uh, uh, refugees population, but bring everybody together really can address the issues more effectively. So um, I would be loved to in, be involved in, in any of, uh, of that. And you're, the, the collective narrative is powerful. Right, right. Especially you, have, you already have some experience and you like to kind of share with this group as well. Sure, definitely, definitely. And even the trials and tribulations of, of conducting research, for example. Um, you know, there's a organization that I belong to. It's a national organization of um, healthcare providers for refugees. I can give you the, the links and so forth. And these are some of the issues that continue to com come up. And, you know, how we, how we collect data, what data needs to be collected to make change is, is an important question in and of itself. And I wish there was more federal funding and state funding for these initiatives. Um, so maybe maybe we can get to that point. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Do we have any other questions, comments? And maybe Dr. Altman, if you could share a little bit more about some ideas you might have in terms of effective collaboration for individuals who are pursuing uh, greater inclusivity of our rural communities? Sure. So um, I think one of the, I would say the one of the most positive outcomes I have seen is so Neomed, and I, I don't want to speak for, for Lucas County and the University of Toledo and the other colleges nearby, but they I would imagine they're doing some of the same things. When we're trying to support our students in their research endeavors and their exploration into public health, for example, um, we've connected our students with our Portage um, Health Department, working with our clinicians, working with our social work, 
um, our administrators and public health officials. And not only there's an education component to that, but our students are carrying out with mentors um, some really important research. And I've had over the years, um, probably the past five or six years, um, maybe a dozen students that have focused on the rural pockets within Portage County. And they've been identifying what are the barriers and not just identifying what those barriers are, but what they look like to the individual. So it's it's quantitative data as well as qualitative data, uh, collecting those narratives of what it's like to be an individual living in a pocket, a rural pocket, and not having for instance, the transportation to say the nearest clinic or uh, not knowing which clinic to go to. Do you go to urgent care versus the emergency room? I mean, we're all battling <laughs> trying to guide patients in that area. Uh, but you know, having, having students along with good mentors, um, reaching out, collecting the information, but also going back and saying, what are some of the solutions to this? And so um, coming back, collecting the data, we've worked with our part of transportation system, we've worked with the public department, we've gotten some small grants at the state level to improve, for example, the transportation issues. Um, during COVID, because we were all receiving some type of federal funding for um, resources for COVID, whether it's vaccines and test kits and so forth, um, the one very few positive things that came out of, of the pandemic was how to collectively bring together law enforcement, hospital systems, educational systems, public health centers um, to increase awareness, um, to increase education, and to make sure that our rural communities um, had the necessary information that they need. And in a language um, that their primary language that they speak. And um, you know, we, we need to do that for everything. When I think of the, the number of heart issues, cardiac issues, uh, cardiopulmonary issues in our area, as well as Lucas County. Uh, these are the things, this is the inf informatics and informational systems that we need to improve upon. And maybe we can take our lead from what we've learned um, through this pandemic and, and actually present that of what, what was learned and how we did it. I hope that answered your question. Yes, thank you so much. We have another question from Richard Cole. Yes, are there any issues or concerns with minors and access to education? Um, not in Portage County so much, but I will say it's um, minors and access to nutritional needs. So we have, you know, public school systems that uh, we've made a concerted effort, making sure that the truancy rate is lower, that there is progression and retention of students. What we're seeing in my county is problems of nutrition, where um, school programs, lunch programs uh, vary across the county. And we're seeing, unfortunately, kids that our basic nutritional needs are not being met. And so I would say that has been our primary concern. I can't speak to Lucas County um, in terms of access to education, um, but um, I, I would say education access here in Portage County is, is improved. We actually have a STEM school here right on campus and have been very inclusive of not just Portage County kids, but also those outside of the county of having access to not just education, but education that has been traditionally or historically um, left for those who had lived in urban environments or um, was a, more of a luxury. And so improving access to different educational modalities is important. I will say from a technology standpoint, when education is offered online, so if there's, uh, aside from homeschooling, um, but online education, there are disparities of children being able to access online education um, due to lack of internet, due to lack of um, having access to computers or reliable computers. And so that would be my 
my concern of, of education and access. Thank you. Do we have any final comments, questions, ideas? If not, we thank you again, Dr. Altman, for your time, expertise, and sharing all these really great insights. Um, this is clearly an area of opportunity and growth for our research community. And we look forward to closing out our Ready Special Populations Roundtable Talk series on Friday, December 1st. We'll be looking into disabilities, invisible disabilities, Crohn's and colitis. We'll have the executive director speaking about that. And we appreciate that all of you attended today. All right. Have a great Thank afternoon. Thank you for having one. me. Appreciate it. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>